evening, everyone. I'm Nadine Molly. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Public Architecture. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, and we're really excited about IPA's inaugural Open City Series New York Paris. I'll now have Michael Kimmelman introduce our topic on Open City uh, New York Paris. He will then be followed by a brief um, presentation by the Deputy Mayor, Jean-Louis Misica, uh, with then um, Bita Mustafi doing a New York response, and then we'll have an open discussion with all of the panelists. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, hi, welcome everybody and Facebook Live people. Um, I, um, I, th I think we're going to talk a lot about sanctuary cities and, uh, and refugees uh, in, in the case of New York and, and Paris. I, I just wanted to um, say a couple of things um, in general. You know, if you think of the sort of large forces shaping this century, um, I, I think the two or three largest forces, I would say, which are all interconnected um, are climate change and the effects of environmental uh, changes on uh, communities all around the world. Um, the obvious immense ur uh, urbanization uh, and the effects that um, that is having on rural communities that are left behind. And the fact that you have the largest um, migrant, uh, including refugee population in human history. Some 65 million people, by some counts, will be on the move by 2050. Um, and this creates an incredible um, sense of uh, opportunity as well as concern. Um, and I think, you know, we come, we are here in a city, uh, New York, in which we're all uh, Almost every single one of us, probably every single one of us, has come from someplace else at some point in our family history. Um, and so there is a certain way in which we understand, I think, instinctively, as, as New Yorkers, the uh, inherent um, benefits of having populations of people who are uh, coming from different places and joining to create what is the common ground of a, of a city. Um, but I just wanted to uh, tell you about a, a trip I made uh, not so long ago to a Syrian camp uh, called Zatari, which some of you may know of. Um, when Zatari opened, it was, um, it was regarded as almost the most disastrous place uh, on the planet. It, it was a camp where Syrian refugees crossing the southern border into Jordan arrived in, in droves, uh, 100,000 within uh, a, a few days, really. And the UNHCR was so unprepared to deal with that kind of enormous uh, influx that the place became uh, notorious as uh, uh, chaotic, violent. Uh, the attempts to control the place were uh, notorious as well. You had lots of tear gas and you had deaths. Um, it, was, it was a very dangerous place, so the, the picture that was being created was not just of the incredible violence and uh, terror in Syria, but now across the border, these people fleeing to a place which was also uh, out of control. I was there maybe 18 months after it opened, um, and what was quite interesting was uh, what had happened I won't go into it at length, but I think it's a lesson about the ways in which um, refugee populations, people who are under the most extraordinary uh, stress one can imagine, who've lost almost literally everything, um, what happens when they are given an opportunity uh, to make a new life? So Zatari, when I was there, as I said, 18 months later, um, had effectively become a pop-up city of some 100,000 people. There was a main street uh, called the Champs-Élysées. There was a off Main Street, a kind of uh, perpendicular street, which was also full of markets. There were um, residential neighborhoods. Um, 
There was, uh, there was a rotisserie chicken place. There, somebody had opened an ice cream shop. Uh, there was a pizzeria. I was in a barber shop next to all of the bridal shops that had opened there. Um, there was a travel agency, even though people weren't allowed technically to come or go. You could book trips from the refugee camp to bring in relatives or to uh, go out uh, from the camp. Um, in fact, the, the people who were there, the refugees, had gone to such lengths to essentially urbanize, to create a civilized uh, place for themselves, that the people who ran the camp from UNHCR had to go to them, for instance, to the pizza delivery guys, to say, how do you know where people are here? We, how do you know how to deliver the pizza? To what address? We do not know any longer where people are, but obviously you do. Because people had moved into urban, essentially they'd created their own blocks and, and areas, uh, streets, um, where they were with people from their own towns and uh, with their own families. They, all of this was completely illegal. Absolutely nothing, including the use of electricity to power all of these shops was actually legal. Um, but the man who was running the camp realized that there were two ways of dealing with this. There was the way that the UNHCR dealt with it in the beginning, which was effectively to try to literally fight people um, who were refugees and who were so desperate. And the other was to say, to treat himself more or less as the mayor of a rapidly emerging and rather large city in which uh, he would negotiate with these people as uh, reluctant but nonetheless citizens of this new place about the use of power, uh, that is electrical power, um, about uh, who controlled the streets. Um, and I thought this was one of the most powerful lessons about refugees and about human nature itself, that um, if one accepts the notion that refugees are not only people um, uh, at, 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 in the most extreme situation, but also people who come like us from backgrounds where they bring enormous uh, varieties of skills, um, ambitions, uh, children with uh, endless hopes, um, that refugees are uh, engines of change and opportunity and growth. And we've seen here in the United States how cities and Rust Belt cities have been completely transformed, Utica, New York, for instance, by the influx of migrants, um, some of them refugees, but many of them just a diverse population of people who have found these places and uh, who have brought them back to life. So I look at Zatari as a, as a good, uh, was in any case at that point, a really very good example um, of a, a deeply human impulse uh, to urbanize um, and of an approach to refugees which is embracing, and I think that's what we um, will hear more of now about Paris, um, and what we need uh, so much to fight for here, of all places <coughs> in the United States. So let me turn this over uh, to Jean-Louis Misica, who will, I think, describe to us what Paris is doing. Well, hello, everybody. I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, with this uh, winter in March, uh, I, I caught cold, and uh, 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 you have to excuse me for, for the tone of my, of my uh, voice. Uh, first of all, I want to, to say uh, many thanks, of course, to, to Mikael, but also to, to Saskia and Richard, uh, who are kind enough to be, uh, to be here uh, with, with me, and maybe a little bit for me. <coughs> And uh, uh, I know that they are coming from a very uh, 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 long trip, so thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to, to share with you tonight uh, our strategy uh, about uh, welcoming migrants uh, in Paris. Paris and uh, New York face the same kind of uh, challenges. Uh, they are hubs for international migration, and at the same time, uh, they lack housing <coughs> units for their own metropolitan citizens. And uh, 
the global cities, as you know, I like a seismograph of uh, uh, everything which is happening uh, uh, in, in the world. Uh, uh, was it a civil war or a, a, a climate disaster? And these global cities have a duty of uh, welcoming mi migrants and refugees, being uh, political or climate refugees. This requires very adaptive and tactical policies to find spaces to, to host them. In 2015, there were 244 million migrants in the world, which represents 3% of the global population. By 2050, the UN estimates that this figure will reach 405 million. The recent geopolitical context has been particularly unstable, with uh, events such as the war in Syria and typhoons in Asia. But we know, we know all of us, that it's only the beginning. Environmental disasters will multiply, and the number of climate refugees will have an exponential growth. Our cities have to prepare to such flows of people, and it is not easy. This is one of the topics where we need to cooperate and share ideas among global cities. Bill de Blasio just announced a global plan for hosting homeless people in New York. In Paris, we recently opened two humanitarian centers for refugees, and we try to invent new metropolitan strategies in an emergency contest. <coughs> this is uh, an image of Paris, of the streets of Paris in November 2016. Migrants were sleeping under a subway station for seven, and it was a camp of 500, 1,000, sometimes 1,500 people. For several months, there were thousands of migrants sleeping in the streets of Paris with several informal camps that were created especially in the north of Paris. Sanitary conditions were horrific, and it was becoming a real issue of public health. A lot of Parisian people were also shocked by those conditions. Even though emergency housing is mostly a state competence in France, it became evident that the city of Paris had to act and develop a real metropolitan strategy. The 115,000 shelters nationwide were not sufficient, especially when nearly half of the homeless live in the greater Paris area. As a consequence, the state-managed centers could not handle the current refugee crisis. Our first challenge, and I think it's exactly the same here in New York, was to find sites in Paris to host migrants. Most of our municipal buildings were already occupied. Therefore, we had to find agreements with our partners, such as the railway company. We knew that we did not have enough space to create long-term shelters for all migrants. Therefore, the challenge was to invent a place where they could stay a few nights and be then sent to other shelters in France. This corresponds to the idea of staircase of transition. Temporary accommodation is the first necessary step before formal and long-term accommodation. Therefore, what we did was to look at every empty building, every piece of land where we could create a humanitarian camp. Like in New York, this is no, there is no real empty space in Paris, but we have always a future urban project. It was therefore hard to negotiate with the owners. I will present uh, the two humanitarian centers that we opened in less than five months. And as you can imagine, five months is a very short period, uh, mainly for uh, projects lead by an administration. They are very different and complementary since one is principally dedicated to men and only provides short-term housing before relocation. This is the one here in the north of Paris. <coughs> 
uh, relocation in other state-managed centers, and the other one is a medium-term center for women and family. The first one is located in the north of Paris, the second one in the south, in a city which is a part of the metropolis, but not of the city of Paris, Ivry-sur-Seine, here. <coughs> in fact, there are a lot more available uh, sites in the suburbs than in Paris. For those two centers, it was a joint work and financing by the city of Paris and uh, the state. The daily management of the centers is given to charity organizations because they have the required skills to tackle the specific issues homeless and migrants are facing. The first center, La Chapelle, opened in November 2016 in the north of Paris on a site owned by the railway company, which will become a university afterwards. Facing the increasing number of migrants living on the public space, the fast completion of the site was crucial. Julien Belair, a young architect, has been hired to create modular shelters being built in no more than three months. The sober design, and you can see it, uh, has been key to reduce the investment cost and further the re reversibility of the center, as seen with the bubble and the containers. <coughs> the center follows uh, United Nations rules for refugee centers. As the warehouse will be demolished to create a new campus, the shelters have been designed for other places, such as parks or other brown fields. They have been covered in order to be waterproofed, after the closing of the center in two years, it will therefore be possible to relocate the uh, shelters. Figures from Emmaus assert that more than 3,500 persons have been welcomed in the center and reoriented, among them 800 minors and 300 families. This center was also useful to oblige, oblige the state to react since they had to, fi to find accommodation solutions for 50 migrants per day. The uh, inflatable reception uh, bubbles gathers all the services for the newcomers. <coughs> uh, while the warehouse have been converted into village of shelters. Since November, so this is here. In November, since November, Doctors of the World and other healthcare organizations have realized more than 1,200 checkups, 900 medical appointments, and 160 psychological counseling. This system, available for every migrant, is funded by the Regional Agency for Health. Concerning administrative matters, Migrants are being given an ID in order to check whether or not they have been registered in another European country prior to their arrival in France due to the Dublin II rules. An association, Utopia 56, provides legal advice and food bank to the residents. Indeed, it has been decided that migrants are not allowed to cook within the center. Meals are being delivered three times per day. Other features include a soccer field, shared living rooms, and artistic intervention to make the center livable and decent. The second center is situated in Ivry-sur-Seine in the south of Paris. We own a former water treatment plant there and therefore negotiated with the local municipality to create a temporary humanitarian village. We transformed it into a center of medium-term accommodation for families. Shifting from the dormitory approach to emergency housing, it has been designed to host families and women for several months. A wide array of services is provided, including a school and a health center. Uh, this project was a technical challenge since we had to build on the top of a water treatment bank, tanks and the architects designed wooden building on stilts. The urban design of the site creates six small villages, each of them comprising six bedrooms. It enables people uh, from different cultures living alongside. Both social workers and volunteers participate in the operation 24 hour a day and seven days per week. As the site is intended for further urban development, 
The wooden buildings have been designed to be movable. When we decided to create the humanitarian camp there, we had just launched an ambitious call for project on that side. And we asked developers, architects, startups to imagine a neighborhood there, and we were therefore a little bit afraid that they abandon this call for the project. Finally, the submitted projects were even better, better and all included a part about integrated refugees in the construction and the future neighborhood. It means that when the definitive project will be organized, there, there still will be a shelter uh, in, uh, in, in the project. As you may know, uh, there, are, there are often uh, debates about the so-called competition of populations. While providing new accommodation for the migrants, some people said that we were discriminating the non-migrant homeless people. Our duty <coughs> is to apply the unconditional hospitality principle. We also have to invent new forms of accommodation for homeless people. I will present you two projects for homeless that are specific for different reasons. The first one, because it was created in a very rich area. The second one, because emergency accommodation has been mixed with other uses and has formed a little utopia in the center uh, of Paris. First, La Promesse de l'Aube has opened this year in one of the richest areas in Paris, something like uh, the Upper East Side uh, here uh, in New York. It is located on the former lane of the Boulogne wood, Le Bois de Boulogne. The reluctance of the neighbors had been tough when the decision was made to build this unit. I remember my first uh, meeting with the population. Uh, I've been insulted during, let's say, one hour and unable to, to say one word. We, we have been obliged to, <coughs> to stop the, uh, the meeting. Petitions have been launched, and public meetings gathered more than 1,000 protesters. As seen uh, on uh, this image on the left, fake photoshops uh, have been created to create fear among the inhabitants. Even uh, though there was no emergency center in the entire district, the neighbors were shocked by the idea of bringing some social mix in that area, and we had some arson uh, during the building. There are five buildings, and you can see them on, 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 the, on, on the picture. Uh, and uh, I think that the, uh, uh, the building is, is interesting. Uh, five buildings, two of them dedicated for families, the other for isolated homeless, and the last one as a common space to gather. To gather. Out of the 200 at the beginning, 45 of them left because they were not ready to live in a formal housing. For instance, some of them preferred sleeping on cardboard rather than on their mattress. It emphasized the difficulties to integrate these people into the society. Uh, however, most of the families still live there and value the green environment of the wood. The most surprising is that since the center opened, all protests stopped, and some neighbors are even volunteering to help the homeless. It shows how much we have to persevere for emergency housing. And finally, this is the example of uh, Saint Vincent de Paul, the place we call Les Grands Voisins. It is a former hospital in the center of Paris that was closed by uh, the hospital company Emergency shelters were created, but we wanted more for the area. It seemed a perfect pla place to mix use and invent a new model where emergency housing interacts with startups, artists, and welcomes visitors from all over the world. It was very experimental for the city of Paris, since we are used to create projects only dedicated to emergency housing, which are often not very open to the public. This site is nine uh, acre, uh, large, and we don't, didn't want it to be a ghetto. Furthermore, since we will transform the entire area into an eco-district mostly dedicated to housing, we wanted to 
the temporary occupation to be a kind of prefiguration of the future users. We could not reach that challenge alone and therefore let three organizations manage the site. Aurore. Aurore is a social organization, first tenant, converted some buildings into shelters both for migrants and homeless. It has no 600 beds on site. Plateau Urbain provides discounted rented spaces for startup NGOs and all kinds of small businesses. 160 structures have been chosen, comprising a wide range of activities from craftsmanship to social economy and training. They have been chosen for their complementarity and their will, and their will for of local invest involvement. And Yes We Camp creates animation on the public space, such as flea market, campsites during the summer for tourists, concerts, and so on. It contributed to attract new visitors to the site and make the neighborhood lively. They created a summer camping in the former hospital, which had a great success. You can see here several pictures of events and parts of the former uh, hospital. Located in a wealthy neighborhood, the implementation of the project has been consensual, thanks to the mixing of functions. The animation of the sites, especially during weekends, attracts visitors from all over Paris. It contributes to reinforce the integration process of the migrants and omelets, providing them with jobs in the bars and startups. <laughs> so we have learned a lot from this uh, last example. First, accommodation for homeless definitely wins from being mixed up with other activities and opened towards the city. This area was a perfect space for that, and we will try to replicate it. Saint Vincent de Paul had become one of the preferred spots on the, of the city, especially among young people, while it hosts 600 homeless. Second, creating temporary accommodation helps the general urban process. It allows to prefigure some users and in a way it reassures the neighbors. In the case of the Center for Families in the south of Paris, the existence of the humanitarian camp has considerably improved the urban project. I meet a lot of other mayors who now want to create a similar area in their city. Third, we are only at the beginning of innovation in that field. In the following years, given the increase both of homeless and of migrants, we have to invent new solutions in terms of quick constructions, flexible buildings, mixed projects, metropolitan strategies, and have, above all to share our experiences and best practices. This is the only way to become real resilient cities. So thank you very much. And to, for, to finish, if it works, uh, I will show you uh, a short movie. Yes, it works. Euh, avec euh, le risque qui pouvait être d'avoir de créer une, une poche euh, de pauvreté, de précarité euh, dans le centre de Paris. L'objectif était justement de créer un, un microcosme euh, qui vienne prolonger le travail social avec une mixité d'usages qui permettent de, de, de venir renforcer le travail euh, social euh, d'Aurore, euh, de permettre euh, aux personnes qu'on héberge de, de trouver un espace de bienveillance où ils puissent se resocialiser, euh, où ils puissent travailler. C'est un site sur lequel il y a beaucoup d'activités économiques euh, qui est créée par euh, l'occupation précaire qui est faite. Il y a une, un autre volet donc, qui est lié à l'accueil de l'autre, à la fois à l'hébergement d'urgence, donc comment on accueille ces gens-là, comment on les accueille dans des espaces qui sont partagés par tous. Donc dans la lingerie, par exemple, on va mettre en place des cafés suspendus, euh, des prix pour les cafés en temps, pour les personnes qui n'ont pas de papier, donc avec le troc shop. Euh, ça va être aussi comment on accueille des visiteurs d'une manière un peu différente d'habitude. Donc on a mis en place un camping. Il y a une première version prototype pendant la COP21. On a mis en place pendant une semaine 100 places d'hébergement en tente pour accueillir les militants de la COP. Et là, depuis fin juin, on a le camping qui est ouvert et où on accueille, on a une centaine de places pour des touristes, des visiteurs. Et le grand public euh, et les résidents du 14e et, le, et, et tous les voisins de ce site permettent aussi, un, de créer l'activité économique sur le site, 
euh, en venant euh, pour des activités de restauration, en venant pour des activités euh, diverses et variées sur le site, et permettent aussi euh, de créer des espaces de rencontre euh, qui, soient, euh, qui permettent aussi d'être ouverts, de ne pas devenir justement un, un village fermé, mais un village ouvert sur son, sur son environnement. Sorry. It's finished. <laughs> Hi. Um I want to start simply by thanking the Institute for Public Architecture for organizing the panel. Of course, the Deputy Mayor of Paris, um, Richard and Saskia and Michael for joining us and for all of you and the Cooper Union for hosting. Um, by way of introduction again, my name is Bita. I'm the Assistant Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs um, here in New York City. For those who are unfamiliar with our office, Much of what we do is uh, serve as a bridge, really, from the mayor's office from the city to um, immigrant communities and New Yorkers at large. We have three distinct missions, including immigrant inclusion, um, accessing justice, and advocacy. Um, and what I hope to do a little bit, and um, briefly today, and then hopefully more in the Q&A, is talk about what that means in practice. Um, we truly believe New York City is an example of what you can do and what you can accomplish by embracing immigrants and refugees. And in this time, um, more than uh, one can recently remember, that is that much more important um, and prevalent in what we're doing. Our resolve as a city has not changed. We believe that we can remain a welcoming and inclusive city while remaining a safe um, city for everybody. And that vision is consistent with, in fact, what Mayor de Blasio's vision for the city has been, um, having an equitable and inclusive city for everyone. Our approach is very much informed by the fact that we are a city of immigrants. We're such a diverse city. We have three million foreign-born New Yorkers. That's nearly 40% of our population. If you factor in the children of immigrants, that takes you to 60% of the population. We have, we're home to tens of thousands of adults and children who have fled danger in their home countries and are seeking refuge here in the US. We don't, on the other hand, receive a large portion of the refugee population because of the cost of living um, here in New York City. But we do receive a sig significant number of secondary migrants, so people who have found New York City as the second place on their journey um, to making the US their homes. Diversity and inclusion are just who we are, and we do, in fact, believe that it works. I'm going to give you some examples of what we mean when we say that. One example is IDNYC. IDNYC is the city's municipal ID program um, that was started and launched by uh, Mayor de Blasio two years ago and has nearly one million cardholders today. This ID is really the, the sort of central heart and core of it, is identification that doesn't speak to where you came from, what your status is, how you got here at all, but rather that you are a New Yorker. And by being a New Yorker, you deserve a certain level of access to city and city government, a certain level of confidence in your interactions with law enforcement, your ability to access resources and connect to things like community spaces and libraries, cultural institutions that are available to all New Yorkers, benefits and discounts, um, and more. We did a study over the summer, an independent study we commissioned, um, around the ID. And what we found was that cardholders used the card in a myriad of ways. They used it as regular ID, They used it to enter their children's school buildings, to interact with police, to open a financial institution account at a bank or credit union. And 66.6% of those surveyed that identified as immigrant respondents said that the IDNYC was the most commonly used ID that they had. 77% of our total respondents 
reported an increased sense of belonging in the city simply because they had this ID that had no other marker but that they were a New Yorker. So that's just a little bit of a picture of what we do, um, and I wanted to keep it brief so we can go into Q&A. Thank you. in law. When a refugee appears uh, at our borders, we can see her. When the immigrant appears at our borders, we can see her. By see, I mean the law sees them. I think we have a third subject today that we'd love to hear, especially what you think about that. And that is a subject that is actually a refugee of certain modes of economic development. And there is no law that captures this. And in fact, in those countries, it, what, what, what is causing the development of plantations, development of mines, land grabbed by the bottlers, you know the Coca-Colas and the Nestlés, these are all negatives for small holders, rural people, etc. But in the, if, if you take the standard measure for the economies of those countries, it is registered like a positive. So this is a subject who is in trouble, in deep trouble. And I think because when she appears at our borders, there is no law. And the countries and the institutions, IMF, say, oh, the country is doing better. I hope that you're with me on this, that you understand what I'm getting at. And there is no law that recognizes this subject. It seems to me, one way of putting it is, we've done the Anthropocene. You know, we've really done it. We've managed to wreck half of the planet more or less. And <coughs> now we face, we have a new challenge. And sort of the image that I have is this massive loss of habitat. It's also happening inside our cities, you know, if, I mean, when people, the homeless, etc. But I'm now particularly thinking about the migrant. And so I just wanted to add that to what uh, Mystica and you have described, which is an amazing effort by cities to incorporate and many of those whom we are incorporating are, in fact, these types of people that I'm describing, this third type of migrating subject. I think I better stop now, right? Because mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'd like to say a little uh, about the uh, idea of a sanctuary city, which has a uh, quite different focus, in a way, than these wonderful projects of incorporation and inclusion. Uh, and the way to understand this, for any of you who are Jewish, you will understand from your, uh, maybe, from your uh, parents or grandparents, um, who were German, that when they were um, uh, menaced, uh, that largely the, well, no, almost entirely, the churches and uh, cathedrals of German cities were locked to them. They were locked out. They had no sanctuary. The sanctuary city movement is an attempt to give people who are menaced from within society a sanctuary, to find places in the city where, as in the old medieval space that the secular order um, 
cannot penetrate, where people are safe. Uh, as that movement exists now in the United States, it's not so much, it's not only about receiving refugees from abroad, but be, dealing with the fact that we, the United States, are creating a refugee problem. We are creating the need for countries or cities like Mexico City to build the kinds of shelters that Jean-Louis has described. And the, what the Sanctuary City Movement is about is an attempt to find a way under, you know, our country is moving towards fascism. We all know that. And the Sanctuary City Movement is an attempt to find out the places and modalities in cities where our Hispanic brothers and sisters do not face the equivalent of what happened to Jews in Germany in the 30s. That was that it was no sanctuary. There were no safe places for them. Uh, the other thing I want to say about this, which is um, a little apart from what we were talking about, but I think comes to it, is that I think because we are moving in this fascistic direction, that uh, it is really for us as urbanites now that the experience we are going to have is the city versus the nation. Mm. That as urban citizens, we are going to have to radically rethink the place we, we occupy in a nation uh, which is producing the need for things like, for actions like sanctuary spaces for. And that this conflict between city and nation is going to get stronger uh, the more our society collapses in to this fascistic state. So to me, the consequence of the sanctuary movement in cities, which I understand largely as a, a, a religious, uh, 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 in religious terms, just from my own background, is that increasingly what we are going to see is a kind of political struggle uh, between <coughs> uh, forces of order in the city and the forces of disorder in the state. Um, so uh, we can debate whether we're going towards fascism or not, but I, I think you raise an interesting point, Richard, because... Um, I don't think it's debatable. <laughs> <laughs> I sure hope it is. Um, but uh, it's interesting because if you look back actually at the sanctuary movement here, it began actually with refugees from Central American countries where the United States was creating wreaking havoc and they were coming here and it was basically churches here which were providing sanctuary and the, you had a government, in that case I guess the Reagan administration, mm -hmm. which was very um, much against the sanctuary movement precisely because they were supporting the governments these people were fleeing. So you have a, a similar dynamic now played out obviously on a vastly uh, larger scale. Um, maybe maybe so you can tell us a little bit about the new, because a couple of people were asking me this before, the, the you know, Trump's 2.0 version of the travel ban and exactly what this means and then what the city's uh, response to this is, uh, is going to be. I'll speak first to the initial ban, because um, I think that sort of frames where we, why we are in 2.0 version. Um, so the initial ban um, essentially uh, put an immediate stop to refugee uh, processing, um, meaning that about half of the allocated number of refugees per year um, would be processed and be allowed to come to the U.S. Um, ended immigration for Syrian um, nationals indefinitely. Um, put a hold on immigration for um, nationals from seven Muslim-majority nations um, for a period of 90 days to review that process. 
um, the nations being initially, um, oh, I'm going to, this is going to be my challenge, Iran, Iraq, um, uh, Syria, Yemen, Sudan, um, I have it listed, but Libya, Libya. Libya. thank you, great. Um, so um, the sort of immediate challenge was that there was no implementation period. Um, so the order essentially <coughs> went into effect, and then Customs and Border Patrol and airports, et cetera, don't sort of have a directive in terms of um, implementation, who it applies to, when, <coughs> where, et cetera. That results in immediate actions at airports across um, the nation, including here at JFK, um, where our office had a presence on the ground as well, um, coordinating with uh, congressional representatives, with um, attorneys who fabulously kind of took camp at JFK, um, and with family members who and friends who were seeking to advocate for individuals who were arriving and immediately detained, regardless of sort of what their status was. So even if they were coming back as legal permanent residents who'd lived here for 10, 20, 15 years, um, visa, valid visa holders, students, and otherwise, um, and even refugee families who were arriving um, in those first few days. That chaos led to immediate uh, court action, as you all know, and to successful litigation that put a, a temporary restraining order completely on the implementation of the order. Um, once that sort of made its way through the Ninth Circuit, there was a determination by the um, administration to not fight to defend the order, but rather to issue a new order that could potentially uh, overcome the, uh, the legal challenges. And one aspect of the order that I failed to mention was that it um, essentially just had religious discrimination within it, um, favoring uh, individuals who were from a religious minority in those countries um, for immigration purposes, so non-Muslims. Um, the new order has an implementation phase that goes into effect on the 16th of March. Um, it no longer lists Iraq as one of the designated nations. Um, it no longer indefinitely ceases immigration for Syrian nationals. It exempts people who have current status in some form, so legal permanent residents, visa holders, um, and others, and it no longer speaks to this uh, religious discriminatory um, language. And so obviously they're seeking to overcome legal challenges, but we know um, already, uh, Washington, Hawaii, and some other states have begun sort of the process of legally challenging uh, this order as well. John, John, how does this differ from French policy? Could you just very basically describe to us how France decides who comes in and who stays and who does not come in? Well, uh, it's not a French policy, it's a European one, uh, as you know, and uh, I hope it will, it will last. Uh, a, a, a little bit. Um, the, there is, there is a, a, a space called the Schengen space, and uh, uh, the, the frontiers are uh, in Greece, uh, in Italy, and uh, uh, this is uh, where, and of course, part of the frontier are France, in the south, uh, the south of France, uh, and, uh, and the um, there is a, 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 a regulation saying that the, 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 the immigrant is uh, 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 registered uh, in uh, the first country he arrived. So this is why there is some big problems with Greece because uh, a lot of migrants are arriving in, uh, in Greece and Greece is not well equipped to, uh, uh, to manage uh, such a flow, a flow of uh, of uh, migrants, so they ask the European community to, to give more money and to organize shelters. Uh, we have the same problem with the, the island in the south of Italy. And uh, the, the, the policy is that uh, there is, uh, uh, when, when, when people are asking for uh, the status of political refugee, uh, there is an instruction uh, in the country where they want to go. But as you know, 
Good Britain is not part of Schengen. Maybe you, maybe you can explain what is happening in Calais and, and so on. But uh, if you want, I can give you some, uh, some details. And uh, uh, so if the, uh, the status of political refugee is, uh, is given, uh, the, 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 the immigrant have, have, a, have a status. And if it's rejected, the difficulties are beginning because we have what we call les sans-papiers, undocumented uh, persons, but they don't leave, they stay. So we have exactly like uh, in the United States, a, lo uh, a lot of people who are uh, uh, without any kind of status because they ask to be uh, political refugees. And of course, there is another new problem, which is that, uh, uh, in contrary with uh, the status of political refugee, there is no status of uh, uh, climate refugee. So if you are leaving a country because uh, of a, a, a drought or an earthquake or a, a typhoon, uh, you cannot uh, ask to be uh, 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 taken as a refugee with a, with a status uh, uh, in, in conformity with the United Nations uh, definition of a refugee. So I think that this is a very important problem, and we need to have uh, an international negotiation about a new status of uh, 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 climate refugee, because the, the next wave of, uh, of uh, uh, migration will be a climate migration and not political migration. Oh, yes, so. Yeah, yeah. And can I add, it's not just climate. I mean, climate change is major, but it is also new forms in which we're using land which really is, there are about uh, uh, 150 corporations which are just buying up land to extract water, for mining, for plantations, to build new cities. And then we have about 15 governments which are buying vast stretches of land. So more and more land in the global south is, is private property. When you look through a satellite image, you don't see that, but that's what it is. That means that the estimate is between one and three million people in, uh, we're talking Global South, uh, are forced to leave. They're sort of grown up, you know, they, they may, and the family may have owned little plots of land forever, but uh, today they're being grown up. <clears throat> Where do they go? The first stop is the big cities in the Global mm -hmm. South. At that point, we, what is no longer visible is the fact that our modes of economic development have expelled these people. They suddenly are urban slum dwellers, and they also, in that sense, lose whatever you know has <coughs> caused their displacement. So I, I think I mean, it's not that I think that law solves problems, but law at least can make visible. So we have refugee law, which is old law that needs to be revised urgently, and we have immigration law. <coughs> And the other thing that I would like to put on the table, because our, our cities, whether that's Paris or, or uh, New York, etc., have benefited from immigrants. Yeah, the course. immigrant is a strong subject. The immigrant leaves behind a place that she cares about, etc., etc. This third type of emerging migrant subject is not an immigrant. There is no place to go back. It doesn't exist anymore. And so, they are really the lost people of today's period. Because the refugees at least have some claim that they can make. When these, this third type, you know, and climate change is part of it, and the other part is are we supposed to be economic development. So we, we are really confronting a major, I think, sort of uh, epochal change. And cities are going to have to become crucial actors. There are enough other things happening at the level of economy, especially, but also politics a bit, that have already identified cities as sort of a, a space that is different from the national economy. So it should be possible in a way, it seems to me, to begin to restructure. You know that you don't need national law. There should be kind of local law, that's what sanctuary cities are. But, but to even take it beyond the sanctuary, and to recognize that urban space is one easy destination for those who are fleeing something, for those who are refugees. How often do you think the city is concerned about the threat from 
the Trump administration of withdrawing federal funding as a punishment. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, that, that funding, of course, will affect what most? Um, so for those who are unfamiliar, what, the first executive order on immigration that was issued sought to um, essentially uh, penalize um, by threatening federal funding to so-called sanctuary cities. I say so-called because there's no legal definition of a sanctuary city as was articulated. This is a historical sort of movement from the 80s um, driven by a wave of immigration from um, Central America um, and really faith institutions declaring themselves sanctuary spaces. Um, so the city sort of absorption of that title. And by the way, they lost that legal battle. Yes. I mean, effectively when it was taken to yes. court, the federal That's right. government, ruled, the federal courts ruled against the That's exactly case. right, yes. And, and Which doesn't mean that they lost legitimacy. No, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't, but it does. It does mean that the, the fact that there isn't a legal definition of this term in this moment is actually quite relevant. Um, and various cities sort of assume different local policies that inform the way that they're perceived and whether or not they fall sort of into this definition or not. Um, we don't generally embrace that because it can be misleading, it can be confusing for all these reasons. But as a result, to your question most point, more poignantly, um, the Trump administration is essentially seeking to define it, right? And it's essentially seeking to define it around cities that it wants to penalize in some way, shape, or form. And if you look at what the order says, it would, it would actually impact um, ironically, if you will, uh, funding that goes to counterterrorism work, funding that goes to um, police uh, enforcement, et cetera, most directly. Um, beyond that, we don't know. We can only sort of speculate. Yeah, but if the federal government withdraws federal funding for cities like New York, it's going to affect public housing. Sure. It's going to affect a lot of programs that are most directly linked to the poor and vulnerable populations, right? It can. So the, the letter of the order is not clear. The only thing it directly would make clear is that funding that goes to sort of terrorism or law enforcement. Right. Oh, uh, that's interesting. When the Obama administration was uh, leaving and sort of thinking about what were the worst things that could possibly happen, yeah. um, obviously health care was high on the list. Climate issues less so because of the kind of existing legal hurdles right. that the EPA and, and the administration would have to undo anything, basically. So you can say what you want to do about carbon emissions and so forth, but there are already Supreme Court decided right. regulations which they have to still abide by. But with, um, but with issues like um, uh, undocumented uh, migrants and refugees, the law at the moment is on the federal government side. So even if the city does not enforce um, what the federal government wants, the federal government even has the right to come into the city as a last resort, right? Yeah, that's right. I, I mean, I think one thing that we have to keep in mind about this is a uh, difference in time, which is that uh, many of the 11 million people under threat of being made refugees by the United States have lived here a long time. You know, a refugee is somebody who has a very, initially, a short time frame of immediate trauma. They have to flee in weeks or days or hours. Um, and we're dealing with the fact that that is, when, when we accept refugees, that we have to deal with that traumatic time frame in the refugees we're making, and I insist on that, we are making refugees, 11 million of them, if, if you really believed uh, that number. The time frame is very different. They've had children here, as you know. They've lived here for 10, 15, 20 years. Um, so that the whole question about um, uh, their relationship to the country in which they're being expelled from is one that they belong here. They've lived here. They belong here. 
And what essentially is happening is that the law is being used as a way to break that very long-term time uh, relationship. I keep insisting about this because I just, I think there's, we, we still have not processed in our minds the degree to which our society is suddenly flipping as many other societies before have flipped from a condition which is relatively liberal, accepting, what can we do for those who are in need, to uh, harming people. We, and we've done that very quickly. Uh, we, are an, uh, we are putting, we are making refugees. And that seems to me to be to be, the, it's a, a complete change in our kind of political understanding of our, ourselves. And as I say, the way in which we, living in New York City, have to relate to, it, to we being Americans. Jean-Louis, I mean, France has a history of also, like you were just saying, very quick shifts, right? Or out with the migrants and then 15 years later, you know, across the last century, mm. oh, we need them, you know, mm -hmm. live after World War II. Now, in France, these issues that we have been, or that the two of them have been raising, how does that play out or in Paris, let's say? Because it seems to me the way you described it, mm. you have a project, you want to accommodate, you have <coughs> some papier have been there for a very long time, they all have access to medical services, yeah. every now and then the police gets very nasty, we know that, mm -hmm. it's not paradise. But what is the difference that you notice in these two descriptions? <laughs> <laughs> How you describe it, it's like you have it sort of together in a way and that we don't quite hear in this country. Well, you know, can we, we, we move to France? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, we will we will organize things specially for you. It's not a problem. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, as you know, we will have a, a presidential election uh, in uh, in uh, in May. Uh, and I was wondering, in, in, I was wondering, how things could uh, go on in France if Marine Le Pen is elected and. I was thinking that it will not go like here in the, in the U.S. because there is a, a, a big difference of tradition, political tradition, between the United States and uh, and France. Uh, here, you people are resisting, but they are resisting using the law, and uh, and the battle uh, is in the court. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 the tradition in France is the streets against the power. And uh, so it means that if Marine Le Pen is elected, I think so, I'm not sure, of course, but I think so, uh, you will have demonstrations and more demonstrations and more demonstrations and the violence will not be uh, uh, evicted. Uh, so uh, uh, in my view, uh, the, the, the risk of an election of, because of course there are difference, big differences between Madame Le Pen and, and, and Mr. Trump, but their vision of immigration and Islam are similar. Uh, and uh, 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 what I think is that uh, in a country like, like France, you cannot imagine a situation like here in the United States with uh, <coughs> the mayor of Paris saying, well, we will go to court uh, in order to contest the uh, decision of Mrs. Le Pen, because uh, it's not exactly the tradition. And uh, the, the, first, the first step will be terrible, because you know when the president, a new president is elected, uh, uh, the first visit is for the mayor of Paris. So what will we do? <laughs> we will accept to have Mrs. Le Pen coming in the, in the city hall. If we think that the city hall is a sanctuary, she cannot go inside. Yeah, but I mean, no. one, one has to, so, I mean, you raised the point, and thank you for asking this. So, I mean, you have, at the moment, you have the runoff on April 23, yeah. and uh, Macron is a, a yeah. little bit ahead, but basically Le Pen is coming up behind, and we mm -hmm. noticed here in the United States that polls 
are not always quite as reliable as we thought. And, um, I hope that ours are better than yours, <laughs> but I, I'm not sure. I suspect they are not. And, um, and so, uh, you know, traditionally you had everyone unite against the Front National, mm -hmm. but why would that happen now? You have increasing, I mean, I think we need to confront the fact mm. that uh, that there were these movements here, or at least the Trump galvanized uh, very um, angry electorate, and Le Pen is speaking to an increasingly large population, mm -hmm. as Builders is in the Netherlands, and yeah. God knows what happened with Brexit. So something is happening here. For us to sit here in New York City and say we believe in the importance of refugees and we understand the economic and social benefits of diversity and mm -hmm. is, is easiest for us to say, but as a practical matter, the political reality is there's an enormous pushback yeah. against this. Yeah. So the question is how, how to respond to that pushback. It can't simply be only demonstrations in the streets. No, there I, has I, to I be agree with you. political and social yeah. and economic it's argument for this, yeah? Yeah, it's, a, it's not a question of, uh, of economy, because the argument of economy is, uh, uh, far uh, uh, beyond the, the fact that it's a question of identity, of uh, uh, cultural choices. Well, it's open society. It, it's it's a, a battle which lasts since the beginning of, of humanity, you know. Uh, Athens against Sparta, uh, 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 Rome against Carthage. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the continental empire against the uh, 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 maritime uh, uh, empire. So s open societies are fighting with closed societies. Mm -hmm. but, and, but Jean -Louis, yeah. I, may, I mean, look at the whole the employment law. There has been an economic, a very strong economic effect in France that has left French workers without the job they hoped, etc. So the economy does not can often be the vector that then enables... No, I, I, I don't agree with that. I, 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 I am not at all uh, uh, in, in favor of an economic explanation of the uh, uh, rising of nationalism and populism in, uh, in uh, European societies. I don't know enough United States, but for, for, for European societies, I think that the main subject is a cultural one. Not a po uh, not an economic one. But isn't the there an unemployment? I mean, young French uh, men and women I don't have the jobs they were expecting to have. The, I mean, there, there is, there is. I, I, I agree with yes, you. Yes, but you when when reduce it to economy, <coughs> but the economic yeah, but is I, different today. I know. I know these theories of uh, the, the, the France peripheric against the France uh, of, the, of the metropolises. It's not true. When you look at the figures, when you look who are voting uh, uh, for Marine Le Pen in France, you see that you have the same kind of uh, 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 revenue distribution as the people who are voting for uh, of course, there are more uh, uh, workers, more employers, but not so more. And the second, the second uh, uh, people, uh, uh, candidate who have, who have the best uh, results uh, among workers is Mr. Macron, who is the guy who wants to have the most open system. And why? Because Macron and Le Pen have one thing in common. They are outsiders. They don't have representative of the main parties uh, who have governed France since uh, the, the beginning. And I think that the question is not a question of uh, uh, economic situation. Of course it counts. But look at the figures. You see that uh, it's exactly the same in the US and in, uh, in France. Uh, the, it's a question of diploma. Diploma is the is a, uh, uh, main discriminant. But of voting. But so look, it's the same as here. You had Bernie and Trump. Mm. So you had outsiders, and there were many ways that the voters who were uh, were the same, potentially mm. the same. But it's not an either-or situation, right? I mean, it's not only. Of course, it's a cultural situation. You have many people. You have extraordinary racism, and mm. you have entrenched nationalism, and all this is there. It's it, the, it's the toxic cocktail 
that comes when you have a population like that which unites with a disenfranchised economic group. So Le Pen's, I mean, Le Pen's support comes, yes, it comes from parts of the very rich South, but also from some of your Rust Belt North, where people now are turning to Le Pen who had not been uh, from national backers. It's okay. a very similar situation to here. I, 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 I understand. I, ju just uh, uh, one, one answer. Uh, you know, uh, Raymond Aron, who was my, 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 my uh, master, uh, used to say about Giscard d'Estaing, who was a French politician, uh, the, the drama of, uh, of Giscard d'Estaing is that it doesn't know that history is a tragedy. And I think that, I think that mm -hmm. people who are uh, sticking to the economic explanation seems to forget that history is a tragedy. And uh, uh, they, 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 are, they believe that if for example, the economic situation is a little bit improving for these people. They think that maybe they will change their mind. They are wrong. I don't think so. I think it's a cultural problem. I think it's a, uh, uh, it's a question of values. And of course, I, I had a friend at the beginning of the conflict in Yugoslavia who told me, well, you know, we will offer to these people to in enter the uh, uh, economic union, and you will see they will choose prosperity against hatred. What was the result? They choose hatred against pro prosperity. And don't forget the, uh, uh, the, this example of, uh, of uh, Yugoslavia. People uh, uh, are not rational, and in politics, rationality is something you have to be very careful about. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I just, I mean, it's a little off our subject, but really. Uh, no, I was just thinking back. I, I, I wrote a, a, a book a long time ago called The Hidden Injuries of Class, which <coughs> was um, a book that dealt with the notion that workers, particularly workers who were unemployed or felt themselves as failures, were very prone to uh, racist, anti-immigrant, even if they were themselves the children of immigrant uh, sentiment. And what's wrong with that, apart from stigmatizing the workers as being losers and therefore uh, protesting, is that the extreme volatility that people have in their feelings, well, we were looking at their feelings about blacks, but I would imagine it's the same thing about immigrants. And it's, I, I think this issue, and it, it goes to why we have a problem, why there are uh, large numbers of Americans who want to, to ship out in boxcars, 11 million, Latinos. Uh, it has to do with a kind of volatility of sentiment about anger. I wouldn't say it's culture, but how to deal with it. And <coughs> we found that the same people who would vote for George Wallace, who was a racist at that time, would also vote for very left-wing candidates. Um, uh, it's a question, if you like, of political culture. I would not say of class, class formation. That, that's, a, that's a very do uh, way of thinking about it. The same thing is true when we did a follow-up study of, of upper middle class suburbanites. That, you know, somebody who would first tell you, oh, I love my black neighbors. Uh, an hour later, uh, we were in a different uh, ball game. The thing, if, if I may say so, I think the thing that what frustration and anger does to people is that it makes them um, uh, monochromatic in the responses about how they can dispel anger. That there is one there, there is an escape valve, whether it's demagoguery like, like Trump, uh, or something else that will release these pent-up emotions. 
When you get a liberal society, an open society, you get a society in which people are able to tolerate a lot of frustration, that they can entertain more than one idea in their minds, and so on. And that, I think we're having a problem about this. New Yorkers, we know New Yorkers can deal with frustration because <laughs> we live with it 18 Probably hours. Probably too. <laughs> yeah, 18 hours a day. But, I mean, I think that what's happening nationally in our culture is the notion that there's a kind of, what Jakob Burkhardt once called a kind of brutal simplification. So that if you feel rage or, or angry or pent up, that there is a way to release it rather than live with it. And those are the conditions for fascism. That's how fascism happens. That somebody says, yes, I will release your anger. I do think there is embedded in the, in the very notion of a city this idea of common ground shared, different people sharing the same space, sharing the same problems, those frustrations are part of the compact one enters into in living in a city. And so there's a sure. kind of very natural um, split between yeah. urban dwellers and people right. who are not in the city, which, which is a philosophical notion of society as well. Yeah. Uh, I guess the, you know, it's... You, Absolutely. You know, Jean-Louis' extremely French and very bleak view of... Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what? Uh, bleak. Uh, <laughs> Does not uh, <laughs> no no austere ah austere uh, uh, yeah. um, <laughs> it doesn't leave us with much much room I think that right we need to figure out a way forward yeah um, and a practical way forward also that invites people here who are uh, obviously have nowhere else to go and mm. uh, um, and it's hard to know what the solutions are. But maybe we can open this up, yeah. and uh, yeah. some yeah. people can ask questions and provide us with solutions. Yeah. And how do you want to do this? Do you want them to come up, and because of your? Well, I could pass it around, see if that works. If you I think. Want to do that, right? You know what? Maybe if people can come up, it might be easier. I can't get this off. <laughs> so okay. So if people could come up and, uh, yeah. and line up, and then uh, that might be easier. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, I really definitely want to congratulate all of you, and I think it was a great, great exposure, great seminar. Or yeah. yeah, a little yeah. closer. Okay, now uh, to Miss Sassen, I want to just agree with her that there is uh, still lack of another type of refugee which doesn't exist right now in the law. By history, you know, we call refugees the people who are involved in wars or are involved in totalitarian governments. But I think the other type of refugee is the economic refugees. And I have to also agree with Mr. Senate about the problems that we are encountering right now in the world and it's basically a lot of them, I don't want to say most, a lot of them created by the United States. You know, in Mexico, I'm Mexican. I live in New York for half my life. I'm an architect. And I feel so sorry for all these Mexican people who come here to try to have a better economic opportunity. But, they, but that problem was created really by the United States. If they really want to stop <laughs> if they really want to stop the immigration to the United States, they should invest more money in Mexico and keep the people, you know, in better shape than that. So it's the, the same thing like it happened. The United States started with the Iraq war, and it turned out to be a disaster because it, they never found any weapons of mass destruction. So this is really what we have to now create, let's say, regarding the status of who is a refugee. I call my people, they are refugees, and they should be given the title of refugees, because although Mexico is not that totalitarian, it's not in war, but the economic situation for these people, which are most of them are farmers, is terrible, absolutely terrible. And I can say 
one reason which I, most people don't might believe, uh, agree with me, and unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever you want to put it, Trump is, wants to do something, something about NAFTA. All don't, these... you, don't you think you two agree? Don't you agree? Uh, with, with what? With yeah, I, I, yes. Yeah, I, well, I, see, so NAFTA, NAFTA really, in reality, has probably created more higher paid jobs, maybe, mm -hmm. but also created a chaos in the lower classes. All these people who are here are farmers. They cannot work their farm because the prices are so low. And also, with the, you know, and also the goods coming from China, they cannot compete even with the Mexican. Yeah. So listen, thank you. It's, I have to be okay. the tough guy. Sure. We, we appreciate this, but we need to ask. No, we, we need to have questions and not. And not. So, but thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, so now the pressure is on you. You have to ask a question. A quick one, yeah. <laughs> um, so in. In terms of sanctuary cities and the sanctuary movement, part of the challenges and the potential success of it is that it, institutions start um, kind of uh, using the methods of sanctuary, how to make uh, whoever is in them safe, uh, especially institutions of learning like the Cooper Union or um, not just churches, right? And uh, so a sanctuary city kind of requires or need for it to succeed needs its institutions to start using sanctuary policies now what would you guys say uh, would be a, a good way to introduce that into institutions sanctuary institu into institutions because the the threats that they're getting from the federal government and the fears that the administrators are are communicating is oh we're going to lose federal funding just like sanctuary cities, but they have different protections, and they're, they're seen differently under the law. So um, for, for the city officials and also for the um, academic um, kind I, of... I think, we, I think we understand the yeah. question. Yeah, so thanks. We, what does it mean to be a sanctuary university or a sanctuary? Yeah. Well, I can... Uh, I only know uh, uh, there's been a lot of discussion in the Jewish community about, about synagogues used as sanctuaries, what would that mean? How could we use a synagogue as a sanctuary? There are some people, thinking back to when we had no sanctuary in Germany, say that synagogues should hide uh, people who are on the run from whatever police will, will be uh, trying to um, uh, to arrest them and you know send them back to to Mexico or below uh, there is another group of people who argue that basically we should be using our fundraising power to when somebody comes to a synagogue find them lawyers and so on but that the physical space should not be a sanctuary that's a big difference the first is civil disobedience mm. Because if, you know, if you're surrounded by National Guard and you say, this, this synagogue is locked, you can't come in here, uh, we're, we're housing criminals and you're not allowed, that is an act of, you know, that's breaking the law. Uh, but those people are at risk. And the debate has been, uh, if what you're doing is, if they come to you, you're performing kind of legal aid service whether they'll be able to avail themselves of it, whether they'll be arrested and deported and trying to get justice, but they're already gone. But Peter, can, I ask, can I ask you, I mean, because university has been coming out yeah. saying we're a sanctuary right. campus and so forth. So what, what does what that actually is. mean? What, I don't know. Yeah. Does it have any meaning at all? I'm, like I said, so-called, right? It's, it's a hard thing. <coughs> and most of the universities have essentially said um, to the maximum extent they can pursue into law. They won't cooperate. Right, right. Pursue into law, right. right? Meaning that there are exceptions. And Does in some that of mean these. Does that actually hide 
uh, it doesn't being... speak to the civil disobedience that really is at the heart of sort of that sanctuary movement initially, right? right? Yeah. And there are interesting um, conversations that I think are happening outside of institutions that are happening within uh, communities. I think um, Chicago is sort of one uh, city that I've read this a lot about of kind of local organizing that's happening within neighborhoods of individuals sort of asserting their um, kind of interest in creating sort of sanctuary spaces theoretically within the neighborhoods um, in terms of other people's homes and also how, you know, from from sort of the basics, knowing your neighbor, knowing if your, your neighbor may, may in fact be at risk of deportation, knowing sort of who is vulnerable in your community and then being able to sort of communicate and assert some sort of resistance, be it through civil disobedience or through opening up your housing to those to those individuals, that I think is actually the space where you have, ha I'm personally seeing more interesting conversations um, around actions to be sanctuaries. I think, I, think, I think that is critical and you make tissue. No city, a big city, I'm not talking about a small town, can be fully controlled. Mm. Sooner or later, power will be brought down, not because there is an equal power, but because it's masses of people, but it's not just a demonstration on the street. It's that you have to make mm. tissue in each neighborhood. So for me, mm. I go back to the economy, yeah. Uh, yeah. Misika. <laughs> <laughs> go so back, go I back. Always say, I yeah. always say, you know, I, yeah. my rhetorical question, do we really need a multinational to have a cup of coffee in the neighborhood? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. It's a good no. question. We have to relocalize, yeah. relocalize. Yeah. If we begin to make economic tissue, mm. you know, economic is only part of it. I agree mm. that it's mm. only part of it. So don't worry about that part. So, so <laughs> I, I think I'm that not people, the, 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 the core element of a city is an enormous diversity of people. And they all have to survive. Most of them are not going to be rich and powerful. And so the, the city is a very special type of space. And, and in that sense, the sanctuary city uh, captures only one aspect. Huh? Mm -hmm. And it's not enough. That we know for a fact. But anyhow. Uh, yeah, okay. can I just add one thing to this too? Okay. I mean, we're, we're having this conversation with the presumption that the Trump administration is going to magically produce all of these new border police who don't exist at the moment. I think I heard somewhere that it takes like five years more or less to train a new border uh, officer. Mm -hmm. and, and the costs of this are just spectacularly large. And so, mm -hmm. like a lot of the announcements by the Trump administration right. so far, they, they sound like the carbon mission stuff, it's, it sounds very alarming and it plays to a certain audience. But actually how much on a practical level this goes beyond political posturing to something real, nobody knows. Certainly not the mayors of big cities. It's going to hit people. There's no way around that. It's already hitting people. However, they cannot execute the full project. Right. That's so the question is where will they no and to what extent. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, I, I tripped <coughs> over you. No problem. My question is for Mr. Misaka. I'm French. Misaka. Uh, Misika, sorry, <laughs> I looked before and I, I'm sorry. Um, well, thank you for the presentation of all the very interesting innovations developed in Paris. Mm. But I think the situation in Paris is more tense than what you have shown us. For instance, the city has installed blocks under the subway uh, so that the refugees cannot camp there. Where, uh, so my first question is who asked for these blocks? Uh, where will the people that, were un that went underneath the subway go? Are the camps you showed us enough to deal with the numbers of refugees that are coming in Paris? And what are the Parisians saying about these blocks? And the last question is, isn't this just a way to move the refugees from inside the city to the outskirts of the city? Or like, for example, in Calais, that is not, I don't think, a big... Uh, something, I mean, I wouldn't say that the situation of refugees and uh, the assimilation of migrants is as easy in France as I have the impression the panel thinks. That's just my question. No, uh, I did not want to, to, to make people think that the situation of the refugees is, is uh, easy in France. Uh, I, 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 I try to explain what we, uh, we did to, to act very quickly to, to, to tackle a situation which was totally unacceptable. And uh, uh, in fact, 
uh, in uh, uh, last year you had uh, refugees, a lot of refugees sleeping in the street of Paris and with the system we have implemented, we have not to solve all the problem but we have solved a part of the problem. And uh, about this story uh, about the blocks, uh, uh, you, you have to keep in mind that uh, in Paris the police is not municipal, it's not like in New York. The police is a national body and uh, it's controlled by the Ministry of Interior. <coughs> and, uh, uh, but we don't disagree with the fact that it's absolutely necessary uh, to uh, uh, canalize the flow of the, of the migrants towards the, 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 the shelters we, are, uh, we, have, we have already built and we are working on the fact that, of course, it's not enough and we are going to make some more uh, places like the ones uh, we, uh, I have, uh, I have uh, shown. Uh, if you have to understand that <coughs> in terms of security, in terms of health, it's impossible to have these campments in the streets. Uh, I don't know if you you have been uh, uh, already in Paris, yeah, but uh, I, Paris I is a, Paris is a city uh, with a, one of the highest density in the world. Mm -hmm. So if you if if in a place where you have already uh, uh, forty seven thousand people uh, uh, for square kilometers, if you if you add three thousand people in the streets, it's it makes life totally impossible. So we are obliged to manage this kind of, uh, of situation and we try to, to be uh, uh, as humanitarian as, as it's possible and organize these uh, places. The second argument is very strange. Uh, the, the, the idea that uh, having a refugee inside Paris and having a refugee uh, uh, outside Paris uh, uh, is something like we, we, we try to put the, we, it's not our it's, refugees. It's, it's, it's the refugees who are coming in, in Paris and Paris now try to be uh, the greater Paris. When we decided to do the, uh, this uh, uh, shelter in uh, Ivry-sur-Seine, of course we asked the mayor of, uh, of Ivry-sur-Seine and he told us, okay, uh, uh, we have to share the burden. You have to keep in mind that Paris, Intramuros, the, the city of Paris, has more than 50% of the shelters of all the region uh, of Ile-de-France. And all the region of Ile-de-France is more than 50% of all the France, of all, all the country. So this is the situation. The, this is uh, what uh, uh, Saskia is saying. Uh, the, 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 the big city is uh, attracting uh, the, the migrants because they know that they will find work and they will find people uh, uh, with, uh, uh, who, who will uh, help them. By the way, about this question of a sanctuary, in Paris we have a, a network of citizens uh, who are acting very quickly uh, when there is uh, an information about for a, a young uh, uh, a student uh, who is in risk of uh, expulsion. And uh, uh, we, uh, we generally, uh, we, what we do, and it, it's, it's uh, efficient, people are going to the university or to the college and uh, 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 impeach the police to, to, to take the, 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 the boy or, or the girl and organize uh, <coughs> the mobilization of the media. <coughs> and after that, go to the court to uh, make the situation of the, uh, of the uh, illegal uh, uh, immigrant uh, changing. So uh, I think that it's also a question of organization and mobilization of the, of the citizen. But Thank you for your response. Thank you. I just wanted to yeah. make you talk a little bit more. Thank you very yeah. much for everything and the, you, the your case, response. The case of Calais is interesting because it was uh, 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 Mr. Sarkozy, the president of France, who have negotiated with, uh, 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 with uh, the Great Britain an agreement where uh, the frontier is in, uh, 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 is, in, is in Calais. So all the migrants who want to go to the United States, to, the, to, to Great Britain, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's an interesting lapsus, huh? Uh, 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 <laughs> who wants to go uh, to uh, Great Britain are blocked at Calais. But I think that this thing could be changed with the Brexit.
Hi. Um, hello. One Sorry, of the. By the way, I just have to say we're uh, we're going to take one more question. So. Mm -hmm. so Two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just we're Ask really sure. fading up here, so yeah. We'll do. Um, first and foremost, I wanted to say uh, salutations, Mr. Monsieur Musica. It's a real pleasure on a Friday night in New York uh, to hear Thank such you. a wonderful insight. It's uh, a pleasure for me, too. So I'd love to just ask Steve Bannon, who's uh, President Trump's uh, senior advisor, has one of his favorite novels. is a French right-wing novel called in the Camp of the Saints by Jean Raspail. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's I've very great. He, so every time he's presented with a policy issue, he, he loves to say, oh, it's like Camp of the Saints. He, he keeps bringing this up. Yeah. So what I would love to ask is, um, there's an ancient Greek term called cakeistocracy, which means rule by the worst. You know, so you don't have autocracy, plutocracy, cakeistocracy. Mm -hmm. So if you were sitting across from some mayors from the US, what would practical advice would you, because I'd love to see <laughs> Uh, if you, you can't run for mayor here. Obama, yeah. they're suggesting, can run for prime minister yeah. in France now. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah. I'd, I'd love to hear... If you want to go to France, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to hear if you... Because you know, these guys are literally reading late 70s, or mid 70s French right-wing literature and talking about his policy now. That's Jean Raspail. Mm -hmm. it, it's, if, if you haven't seen this book, it's a very controversial book. Mm -hmm. But I'd love to hear if you were sitting across from practical you know, issues in mayors in the U.S., uh, maybe some other tools or counter tools that you would su suggest uh, for them to listen to or read as well. So that's my question. Thanks. Wow, it's it's very. I, I've I've disc. By the way, I've discovered discovered the the existence of this book because I've read a, 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 a paper about the fact that Mr. Bannon is always citing it. This book is totally unknown in France. <laughs> <laughs> so. I, and I've never heard of this, uh, of this author. So he has very strange readings, you know. But at least he's reading. And, the, the, <laughs> and for Mr. Trump, the question is still uh, upon you. Know? And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, well, it's very difficult to give a, 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 a conseil uh, because uh, uh, as I explained before, the, 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 the political culture is so different uh, in, uh, in France and uh, in the US, uh, in, uh, in Paris and in New York. Uh, what is very strange is that the way of life, the style of life of New Yorkers, of Parisians, are similar. And uh, when I'm here, I, I, I don't feel uh, uh, to be in, a, in, a, in a, an, a foreign country. I'm in New York, I'm in Paris, but New York and Paris are so similar, I, even with uh, the frustration of the inhabitants, you know, and the capacity uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, getting angry of everything. And, uh, <laughs> But, but the political culture are so different, and uh, uh, I don't know if it's possible. For example, I, uh, I come back to my example of, uh, uh, of uh, the question, if Mrs. Le Pen is elected, uh, will, would uh, the, uh, the, 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 the mayor of Paris accept to receive her uh, in, uh, 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 in, the, in the city hall? Uh, I think that this kind of question is impossible in the U.S. If it's the rule, the, the mayor of New York will receive the, 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 the president. In, in France, this question is really serious. So uh, I cannot say anything uh, in order to give a counsel. I say that resistance is a good word. You have to resist, resist, and resist again. This is it. You know, and uh, you have to resist maybe two years, maybe four years, maybe eight years. I hope so. <laughs> Not, uh, but but uh, uh, I think that resistance is the main word to share all over the world against nationalism and uh, populism and hatred. Thank you. That's a good way to uh, end. Mm -hmm. And so I want to thank everybody. On the <laughs> thank you all. For